Beethoven's great Hammerklavier Sonata Opus 106 is one of the most famous piano works ever written. Its technical difficulties are legendary and so are its excessive tempo indications. How did people in the 19th century deal with the enormous musical challenges of this work? How did they handle the crazy tempo that Beethoven demands in his metronome markings? We will probably never know, and maybe that's even a good thing, but we can journey back to the 19th century, consult written sources, and listen to people talking about this extraordinary work and its performance. First up, Franz Liszt, who was one of the most important interpreters of all time. He was one of the first pianists ever to perform the Hammerklavier Sonata publicly. He loved the piece, he made it famous, and he reported its duration. Amazingly, that duration is more than 20 minutes longer than the duration resulting from Beethoven's own metronome markings. My name is Bernhard Ruchti and I invite you to join me on an extraordinary journey back to the 19th century and to discover the secrets surrounding Beethoven's great Hammer Klavier Sonata and its performance. Here we are at the Tonhalle St. Gallen in Switzerland, where I recorded Beethoven's Hammerklavier Sonata as part of my uh, tempo project. We are now going to talk about the work itself. After that, I'm going to present some historical editions to you. After that, we will discover how Franz Liszt played the Hammerklavier Sonata and what he has to say about the work. And finally, we will listen to some examples of the Hammerklavier Sonata and talk about interpretation and tempo. Beethoven composed the Hammerklavier Sonata in 1817 and 1818 and published it in 1819 under the name Große Sonate für das Hammerklavier. The term Hammerklavier has no special meaning, it's just the official term for a modern piano. That time was the time when Beethoven became completely deaf. It's also the beginning of his conversation books, so we can imagine that this was a rather challenging time for him. It's without any doubt one of his most complex works uh, ever written. It consists of four movements. There is an initial uh, allegro, followed by a surprisingly short scherzo and trio. The third movement is an adagio sostenuto, and the last movement is a slow introduction, largo, with a quite extended fugue. It's the only work by Beethoven that has original metronome markings, and those metronome markings are really famous for being excessively fast. You can see those markings here, it's minim or half note equals 138. That's the famous metronome marking that always comes up in discussions about excessively fast metronome markings in general. The scherzo is dotted minim equals 80. That's pretty fast too. And so is the marking for the adagio, uh, quaver 92. That's almost more like an andante, actually, than an adagio sostenuto. The marking for the largo, semiquaver 76, is probably the most normal metronome marking, and it matches very well with the movement. The fugue, fugue is again very fast. Quarter note equals 144. That's even faster than the first movement, actually, compared to the fastest note value. It's interesting to see that already during Beethoven's lifetime, and even more after his passing, there was a debate about 
those metronome markings and about the tempi connected to those markings. And that discussion is reflected in different editions that came out, and now we are going to have a look at some of those historical editions. This is the Vienna first edition that came out in 1819 with its very beautiful front page. If you go to the first movement, we see that famous metronome marking minimum or half note equals 138 and the time signature which is cut time. This is uh, the second issue of the first edition with the same publisher and the same indications. It came out in 1856. So once again, the minimum uh, 138 and the time signature cut time. The next two editions here uh, were done by Ignaz Moscheles. Ignaz Moscheles was an important figure in the 19th century. He was a pianist and music pedagogue. He was the teacher of Felix Mendelssohn, for instance. And he was pretty close friends with Beethoven, so he knew him well as a person, as a character, as a musician and as a composer. So his editions are an important source for Beethoven's works. This first edition came out in 1840. It was done for a publisher named Speer in Braunschweig in Germany. And if you go to the first movement here, we observe something very surprising. The metronome marking has changed. Instead of minim 138, it's now crotchet or quarter note 138. And we also see that the time signature has changed. Instead of cut time, we find common time here. There is a later Marshallized edition, which was very popular. It came out around 1860. It was done for a publisher in Stuttgart. And if we go to the first movement here, we again see the metronome marking uh, crotchet or quarter note equals 138, but the time signature has been changed back to cut time. So, um, if you look at the time signature at first, um, we can see that, of course, they are different. This is common time, this is cut time. And the option is quite natural that this could be a misprint. And uh, in my opinion, the likelihood is quite high that in fact it is a misprint and that it was supposed to be uh, cut time. But of course, I cannot prove that. But we can be sure that the metronome marking is no misprint. It's the same in both editions. And in addition to that, there is a statement by Marshallis himself, where he talks about this metronome marking and his decision to half the metronome marking. This statement was published in the book The Life of Beethoven, which was published by Schindler and Marshallis, and I'm going to read it for you. So Marshallis says, I have in my edition of this sonata marked the time of the first movement 138 of Meltzel's metronome because Beethoven himself had fixed that number. He gives it with a minim, I with a crotchet. But neither of these can, to my mind, be made to suit the character of the movement. The minim increases it to so fearful a prestissimo as Beethoven could never have intended, since he desired the assai, originally prefixed to the allegro, to be omitted. The crotchet slackens the movement all too much, and although I have, in my edition, 
allowed Beethoven's numbers to remain in de deference of, to the great man, yet I would advise the player to hold the middle course according to the following mark, minim equals 116. So, there is the original metronome marking by Beethoven, minim equals 138, then half that tempo in the two modulus editions, quarter note or crotchet equals 138, and modulus suggestion to go for the middle chorus, as he says, with minim equals 116. I would like to demonstrate these three tempis now at the piano. So I'm going to play the first uh, eight bars of the first uh, movement. And first I'm going to play it according to Beethoven's own metronome marking, minim equals 138. I guess you can decide for yourself whether or not this is so fearful a prestissimo, as Marshallis puts it. I'm now going to play the same passage according to Marshallis edition, so half the tempo with crotchet equals 138. Marshallis thinks that this is too slow. I wouldn't be so sure. Sounds quite nice, but that's what he says. Now, he suggests a tempo of minim equals 116. That would be like that. which is noticeably slower, but still rather fast, in my opinion. As far as Beethoven's original tempo is concerned, there is one uh, recording that I know of that actually reaches that kind of speed. It was done by uh, Michael Korstik about 15 years ago, I think. So in case you would like to listen to the whole first uh, movement in Beethoven's tempo, then I recommend that. Um, recording. Also, if you want to learn more about Beethoven's metronome markings or metronome markings in different editions of Beethoven's works, I recommend Martin Nordwin's thesis on the matter, which came out, came out a few years ago. This brings me to a next edition, which even more reflects that historical debate about Beethoven's tempo, and this edition is now done by Hans von Bülow. This edition was done in 1871. It's an instructive edition, so with quite many comments and remarks, and it's very, very interesting to read those remarks. This is the first movement, and as you can see, the metronome marking has been changed to minim equals 112, so quite close to the suggestion made by Ignaz Moschelis. Bülow actually comments on that, and I'm going to read his comment to you. With the metronomization, insofar as it principally affects the character of the principal motif, the editor, so Bülow, finds himself considerably at variance with the statement of Karl Czerny. So Bülow apparently thought that the original metronome marking uh, of minim equals 138 would go back to Karl Czerny and wasn't aware of the fact that this was Beethoven's own metronome marking 
But anyway, he talks about the speed here. So, Carl Czerny, who, in his quality of first and contemporaneous interpreter of the later pianoforte works of Beethoven, deserves to be consulted as an authority, of course, not altogether an infallible one. <laughs> Czerny's tempo, minim equals 138, that so little agrees with the ponderous energy of the theme and seems to be taken too quickly even for the sections of this movement which admit of a greater acceleration, perhaps finds in the lack of sonority of the Viennese pianofortes of the time a kind of justification. On a modern concert grand of the first quality, and such a one, in a certain sense, a substitute for the orchestra, is required for the due rendering of this sonata, Czerny's tempo would have a bewildering and blurring effect. And Bülow even goes further than Marshallis and he makes changes to the metronome markings not only for the first movement, but also for the other movements, as you can see in this table. The first movement is slowed down from 138 to 112. The scherzo is slowed down from 80 to 66, so once again noticeably slower. Bülow left the adagio, but made a remark and says, in the case of pianofortes of greater sonority, the tempo can be taken still slower. He also left the Largo with semiquaver 76, and he once again slows down the fugue from 144 to 138. That's not significantly, just a little bit, so to speak. It's interesting that Bülow makes some other uh, remarks uh, concerning tempo. As you can see here in the uh, Largo, like the introduction to the fugue, because he adds metronome markings for every section that has a different tempo. Now, if you look at this part, it says un poco più vivace. That means a little bit more lively. But Bülow's metronome marking is actually a lot more lively because it's more than twice as fast as the initial tempo. So here we have semi-quaver 76 and here he says quaver 88. So that may represent Bülow's ideas um, of this passage, but it doesn't really match Beethoven's original uh, metronome marking. That's just some strange thing to observe. This brings me now to Franz Liszt and his interpretation of the Hammerklavier Sonata. Franz Liszt first encountered the Hammerklavier Sonata when he studied still with Czerny in Vienna. And actually, there is a funny story about that, because apparently Czerny would not allow that Liszt study the sonata, but he did it anyway, because he just wanted to uh, learn the piece. In any case, there is a very important date uh, in terms of the Hammerklavier sonata, and this is May 18, 1836. That's the day when Franz Liszt performed the Hammerklavier Sonata publicly in Paris. Uh, at that time, there was some sort of rivalry with Sigismund Thalberg, and Liszt really wanted to establish himself as a serious pianist. And of course, uh, performing the Hammerklavier Sonata was a very good tool to do so. There is a review of this concert by Hector Berlioz, who was present, and it was published in the paper Revue et Gazette Musicale in Paris, 
uh, on June 12, 1836. And I'm going to read uh, Beethoven, um, Berlioz's uh, description of Liszt's interpretation to you. So Berlioz says, it's a part of my opinion, that is his opinion that Liszt is a serious uh, pianist, in support of my opinion, I will quote the opinion of all those who heard him play Beethoven's great sonata, that sublime poem which, for almost all pianists, was until now the Sphinx's enigma. Liszt has interpreted it in a way that the composer, if he could hear it, would have shuddered with joy and pride in his grave. Not a note was omitted, not a note was added. I followed the score. Not a change was made in the tempo that was not indicated in the text. Not an inflection, not an idea was weakened or diverted from its true meaning. Especially in the Adagio, in the reproduction of this unheard hymn, that Beethoven's genius seems to have sung to himself while soaring alone in the immensity, he has constantly maintained the level of the author's thought. One couldn't say anything more, I know, but one mustn't say anything less, because it's true. This is the ideal performance of a work once deemed unperformable. Liszt, by reproducing in this way a work that is still misunderstood, has proved that he is the pianist of the future. Two things are interesting uh, in this review, or particularly interesting. First, Beto um, Berlioz points out that Liszt didn't omit one note or add one note that sheds an interesting light actually on the performance practice of the time, you know, where pianists would like omit or add notes all the time. The second thing is his remark about the tempo. It's important to read very precisely because Berlioz talks about the tempo changes. He says that Liszt didn't add any changes in tempo that weren't like required by Beethoven, so he talks, for instance, about the ritardando in the slow movement or about the various changes in the largo. He doesn't really talk about the tempo, the absolute tempo itself. Berlioz says that Liszt's performance was the ideal of a performance of this work, and that's the kind of comments we find often uh, when people talk about Liszt playing that sonata. I would like to share another example now by Richard Wagner, who talks about the B, major, B flat major sonata in his essay about conducting in 1869. There he says, it's a little bit complicated German, but I hope you will understand. So, furthermore, I wonder if anyone from that pietistic musical mediocrity association, whom I will immediately consider in more detail, could honestly testify to me that he could have truly known and understood this sonata before hearing Liszt play the great Beethoven B flat major sonata. At least I, along with all those who witnessed this wonderful experience, felt compelled to affirm this indispensable confession in true emotion. So basically, he says that anyone, no one could say that he understood Beethoven or this sonata in uh, particular before having heard Franz Liszt perform this sonata. Liszt performed the Hammerklavier sonata quite a few times publicly and also quite many times in private. And he also edited the work in a complete edition 
of Beethoven's piano sonatas that came out in 1857. And I'm going to demonstrate and show you this edition. There is actually a funny story connected to that list edition. There was a publisher in Wolfenbüttel called Ludwig Holle. And this uh, Mr. Holle was actually kind of a rogue because in the 1850s, he started publishing several editions of classical um, pieces. And this is a complete edition of Beethoven's Piano Sonatas edited by Ignaz Moscheles once again. So far, so good. But the problem was that Moscheles didn't know anything about this. So what Holle, the publisher, did was he took the Speer edition from 1840, which I presented to you earlier, which was indeed done by Ignaz Moscheles, and he just copied it and published it under his own name, saying that it was um, edited by Moscheles, I guess, in order to make a little more money. Even more strange than that, there was even a second edition of the same um, fake publication, now once again uh, edited by someone else called Stolze. It's pretty much the same, but some of the metronome markings are actually changed. Moscheles learned about that, of course, and he published a protest against it, so it was like a little scandal in the 19th uh, century. Now, the same publisher, Holle, also got in touch with Franz Liszt around the same time when this edition came out, and he discussed with Liszt also the idea of a complete edition of Beethoven's piano sonatas. Liszt knew about the Moscheles scandal, but he said, well, that wasn't really his problem because he would like publish his own edition of Beethoven's piano works. And he was very interested to do such an edition because he cared very much about Beethoven's piano music and a accurate interpretation of those sonatas. So in 1857, Franz Liszt's uh, edition of the Beethoven sonatas came out with Holle in Wolfenbüttel. Now there is something very interesting about this. If we compare those two editions, we see that the plate numbers are the same. So it's 39 in the fake Moscheles edition and it's 39 in the list edition. So that means they used the same plates for both editions. So they took the fake Moscheles edition and changed it for the list edition. If you observe this edition done by Franz Liszt, we see quite many changes made. Some of them in terms of the actual music, so notes were changed. Most of them in terms of articulation or phrasing. Since the plates are the same, we can conclude that the changes made for the list edition were actually intentional. So with a quite high level of certainty, we can say that the changes we witness in the list edition really were intended by Franz Liszt. I would like to give you two examples of such changes. One is a change about the actual music, the other one about phrasing. The first example is taken from the first movement, bar 321. It's this passage. In the fake Moscheles edition, we find the same version as in the Viennese 
first edition. I'm going to play it once more and more slowly set, so that you can follow the harmonies. In the Liszt edition, this uh, was changed to an other harmony, as you can see here, and it sounds like that. So apparently Liszt thought that the original Viennese first edition was somehow wrong and changed it to this new version. The second example is taken from the Adagio, right at the beginning, starting at bar four, and this is now about phrasing. As you can see here, the fake modulus edition has a bow in this middle bar from the first to the second note. This bow is missing in the Liszt edition, but the Liszt edition shows a pedal indication in the bass. And actually, the fake modulus edition represents uh, the version that is published in the, the original uh, modulus edition for Speer, whereas the Liszt edition is changed back to the original Viennese first edition. Now, this has consequences in terms of interpretation because the phrasing is different. In the fake modulus edition, the phrasing uh, takes place at the end of the bar, whereas in the list edition it takes place in the middle of the bar. And that sounds quite uh, differently. I'm going to demonstrate that. I'm going to overdo it a little bit so that you can hear what I mean. So this is the modulus version. And the list version is like that. Of course, it's a small detail, but it's like a noticeable difference. And there are quite many of those to be found in Liszt's edition. In Liszt's edition, we also find metronome markings, and it's very interesting to compare those metronome markings to Beethoven's original metronome markings. Uh, in this table, uh, you see both metronome markings. It's minimum 138 for the first movement, dotted minimum 80 for the scherzo, quaver 84 for the adagio, quaver 76 for the largo, and crotchet 144 for the fugue. So all the fast movements remained the same. There is a change for the adagio. Liszt slowed it down a little bit, noticeably down, from 92 to 84. He also changed the largo, and this is now much more surprising because he changed the note value. Instead of semiquaver 76, we find quaver 76. So that basically means that he doubled the tempo. Also, the original remark by Beethoven that one should really count uh, the single semiquavers is missing. Now, that's quite a huge change. And of course, it's as well one of those cases where we can I presume that it could be a misprint, and I actually think that it's quite likely that this uh, is the case. It would be a surprising one because the metronome marking is well visible in the edition and could easily have detected, but that's just how it is. But it's different for the Adagio. So the Adagio really represents an intentional change of tempo, uh, which is very interesting and and provides a lot of information, and I'm going to come back to that later. Liszt not only published his own edition of the Hammerklavier Sonata in 1857, 
he also talks about its duration. That is almost 20 years later uh, in a letter that he wrote to the Countess of Sein Wittgenstein on October 26, 1876. There he talks about the work and he says that it took presque une heure, that's in French and in English it means almost an hour to play the work. This information is particularly valuable because it's an information that comes out of a performance practice. We could easily imagine Liszt playing the sonata for himself and actually watching the time and realizing that it took almost an hour. Now, if we compare that to Liszt's metronome markings and to Beethoven's metronome markings, we find something amazing, as you can see in this table. The duration resulting from Beethoven's metronome markings is around 33 minutes, more or less, of course, depending on how long the intermissions are between the movements and how big the rubato is, etc. But that's quite an accurate number. It's about 35 minutes for the list version because the adagio is slower. If we compare that to almost an hour and say almost an hour is maybe 55 minutes, we find a difference of 20 minutes, which is huge. Like if we look at the original duration uh, resulting from Liszt's own metronome markings, it's more than half of that duration. What is this? How can we deal with this kind of contradiction? Which of the two is right? That actually brings me to my approach to the work, my own interpretation, and I'm going to explain to you now how I decided to play the work in terms of tempo. First, I would like to come back to that comparison of Beethoven's and Liszt's metronome markings. As I've said before, the adagio, the change that has been made for the tempo, for the metronome marking, represents an intention. This is also the case for uh, all the phrasings and articulations that were changed for the adagio. And in fact, if you overlook the sonata, the adagio has by far the most changes. So it shows the most work done by Liszt. And we can really say that this movement represents uh, his decisions his ideas and his intentions. And that was my starting point. So I took the adagio and I think that the tempo given by Liszt, uh, Quaver uh, 84, is a perfect tempo for that movement. It has a wonderful flow and is slow at the same time. So I took that and I took Liszt's duration of almost an hour, which is like something around 55 minutes, I took those two things and what I did is I just arranged all the other movements around the adagio. And this is the result of this. For the Allegro, I have a tempo between 144 and 160. For the Scherzo, it's 120 for the crotchet. The Largo is semiquaver 76 and the Fugue is a crotchet 80. So I took the original tempo by Liszt for the Adagio. I also took the original tempo by Beethoven for the Largo, but I slowed down all the fast movements. So the Allegro is not quite half speed. It's faster than half speed, but it's significantly uh, slower. The Scherzo is practically half speed, and the Fugue, again, is almost half speed. If you look at that, of course, you will ask an important question, and that question is, how likely is that? 
how likely is it that Liszt's performance was something in that direction? Of course, I cannot come up with some final uh, conclusions about that. If I wanted to do that, I would have to time travel, which I cannot do. But I would like to present three aspects that, in my opinion, speak in favor of such a scenario. First aspect is Liszt and Beethoven in general. Second aspect is Liszt and the phenomenon of slowness in general. And the third, probably the most important aspect, is answers from the score of the Hammer Klavier Sonata itself. Franz Liszt is one of the most important Beethoven performers in the 19th century as a pianist and as a conductor. Starting in 1842 in Berlin, he repeatedly and regularly conducted Beethoven symphonies. For many of those concerts, there are press reviews, and it's very interesting to see that surprisingly many of those reviews bring up the aspect of tempo. Uh, I would like to read an example of such a review. Uh, it's about a performance of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony that took place at the Beethoven Fest in Bonn in 1845. And it's very important to keep in mind this was still during Liszt's virtuoso period. He was still touring as a virtuoso, so this is not the late Liszt. This is uh, Liszt at his prime time. It's a review that came out in the musical world in London on, on the 2nd of October, 1845. And here the reviewer says, the symphony in C minor was on the whole an excellent performance. Liszt conducted with spirit and a manifest comprehension of the score, which as he knows the symphony by heart is not to be wondered at. The tempi, of the various movements, however, appeared to me to be taken too slow, especially in the finale. But Spohr, Moscheles, and Sir George Smart, three excellent authorities, assured me that I was wrong and that I had been accustomed to hear them in London too fast. Statements like that appear in many different reviews throughout the year. Um, actually, if you want to learn more about that or read some more of those statements, I recommend my book about Franz Liszt's Atenos fantasy. It's in German, but uh, still, <laughs> it contains a whole chapter about Liszt's Beethoven interpretation and shows uh, a number of such press reviews about him conducting Beethoven's symphonies. So after those reviews, we can be quite sure about one thing. Liszt was not a fast Beethoven performer, at least what uh, the symphonies are concerned. And that says quite a lot about his ideas. So it's quite likely that also the Hammerklavier Sonata was performed by him not in a too fast way, but in a way that emphasized slower or at least moderate tempi. That brings me to the aspect of Liszt and slowness in his own works. Uh, I've talked about this aspect already in the introductions to the uh, Adnos fantasy and to Liszt's Anne de Pelerinage, and I would like to share two more examples with you here from Liszt's own compositions. Generally speaking, the aspect of slowness is something that we find a lot in Liszt's uh, works, mainly in his later works, but not only. There are some early examples too. The first example I would like to share is an excerpt of his Requiem, which was originally composed for male chorus and organ, but also exists in a version for organ solo. 
Uh, it's one of the rare examples that has original metronome markings by Liszt himself. That's really rare because he apparently didn't love the metronome very much. We'll now listen to the beginning of the Sanctus, which is a 3-2 bar, and the metronome marking says minim equals 40, which is very, very slow for such a bar. I recorded that piece along with uh, lists fantasy and fugue on at nos at salutarem undam for organ at Merseburg Cathedral, and we will now listen to that short excerpt. <laughs> The second example is now a piano piece. It's called Infesto Transfigurationis Domini Nostri Jesu Christi. So it's about the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. Liszt wrote that piece in 1880. Now, unlike the organ, the piano sound fades away immediately. So if you slow down the tempo, then you need to come up with something just to keep the sound going. And one of those tools are arpeggios, and that's exactly what you will hear in this composition. So if you listen to the bass, you will uh, see that there is a very, very slow and calm movement that stays that way, and that is in a way accompanied by those arpeggio uh, motifs that even slow down more towards the end. Uh, I played the piece after the autograph. Liszt made some minor changes to the final version, but uh, I like the autograph version very well, and um, I think that it represents this aspect of slowness even more. <laughs> 
If you listen to the Requiem and this short piano piece, I'm sure you will notice that they have a certain mood, a certain atmosphere of really listening carefully to every single thing that is happening. And I must say, I wouldn't be surprised if that kind of attitude, that kind of approach uh, would also have been the case for Liszt's approach to the music of Ludwig van Beethoven, which is so rich in little details. That brings me now to a few musical examples that I would like to share with you. If we talk about tempo, it is important to realize that tempo is only one aspect uh, of interpretation. And in fact, it's important to see whether or not a certain tempo matches with other aspects of interpretation. And I would like to share a first example with you that shows that too fast a tempo actually, in a way, contradicts or starts contradicting other indications in the score. And that is the very beginning um, of the first movements. In bar eight, you see that Beethoven uh, indicates a ritardando, that's right before the fermata, and this ritardando is surprisingly short. I will now, now play again the beginning in a fast tempo and just watch if you notice the fermata. Have you noticed? I wouldn't be surprised if you hadn't. Because the problem is that in this tempo, this ritardando is so short that you can't practically do it. And it sounds like driving against the wall with a car. Buff. So it's really very abrupt. So in a way, this tempo does not fit with the rest of the information Beethoven gives uh, in his score. Now, if I play it in my tempo, I can execute that ritardando perfectly. It sounds very natural to me, and I think that in such a tempo, actually, there is an accordance between the interpretation and that retardando aspect of the score. If you listen to, perform, to, to fast performances of this beginning, you will notice that most musicians, with good reason, of course, start the retardando way earlier. Some of them two bars earlier, but because they feel that they cannot really follow that uh, indication. Another example is also from the first movement, it's the passage starting at bar 235. Now, this is a purely musical thing. This passage is so rich in harmony. It's even fast in that slow tempo, and I could easily play it even more slowly. Now imagine that twice or even compared to this slow tempo three times as fast, you wouldn't notice a thing of that. And this is a good example for that hearing quality. I wouldn't be surprised if it were important to list that people could actually hear all those beautiful details of Beethoven's score. <laughs> 
The next example is somewhat similar. It's now from the second movement, uh, and it's bar 24. It's this passage. It's nice to see that Beethoven always uh, adds a pedal indication for this little C minor passage, which creates some sort of how can I say that? Mystical quality. Now, in a tempo that even comes close to the original indication, uh, you can't hear any of this. It pretty much goes by unnoticed. Whereas in a, in a slower tempo, you can even add a little rubato and really bring out the quality the nice quality of that passage. Once again, this can only be done in a moderate uh, tempo. Moving on to the third movement. Now here's the situation somewhat uh, different. Here, uh, in a way, I would like to plea for a more flowing tempo. The original metronome marking um, Quaver 92 is quite fast and still lists a metronome marking which is, a, which is 84 and slower than Beethoven's, has a certain flow which is important to bring out the 6-8 bar. If you play that too slowly, you can't realize the big bar structure. At the same time, it still allows to bring out two huge retardandi that are indicated by Beethoven. The first one starts at bar 107. This only works when you start with a certain flow. It's that passage. This retardando is somewhat extreme, but that's what Beethoven writes. And if you listen to performances that are uh, slower, you will see that either the retardando doesn't come out or the music falls apart. So that, again, speaks for a, uh, like keeping a certain flow. Finally, in terms of interpretation and in terms of music on my recording, remark about the, the piano that I used. It's a Bechstein grand piano and it's a very special instrument. I asked my piano technician, Mr. Urs Bachmann, to share some insight and information about this instrument. We stehen here for einem Bechstein Flügel, Jahrgang 1921. Dieses Instrument wurde vom dann zumal großen Pianisten Wilhelm Backhaus gespielt. Er hat eigentlich all seine frühen Schallplattenproduktionen mit diesem Instrument aufgenommen und das Instrument stand exklusiv für ihn zur Verfügung. Während des Krieges wurde dieses hat er aufgehört damit zu spielen, logischerweise. Er ist ja dann im Endeffekt nach Amerika ausgewandert. 
und das Instrument hat den ganzen Krieg in der Fabrik in Berlin überlebt und wurde eigentlich bis in die 70er, 80er Jahre praktisch nicht mehr gespielt, bis ich das dann bekommen habe. Das Instrument ist alles noch original, original Beseitung, original Resonanzboden. Wir haben nur die Hammerköpfe mal ausgewechselt und ich gehe davon aus, dass das eines der letzten Exemplare ist von Bechstein, von den Instrumenten, was Bechstein berühmt gemacht hat, das noch so original erhalten ist. Und das ist eigentlich, ich sage immer, das ist das Instrument, was uns heutzutage zeigt, was Bechstein berühmt gemacht hat. So this instrument represents the sound that Franz Liszt heard when he played the Hammerklavier Sonata in the 1870s. He had a Bechstein grand piano in his home in Weimar and many other places where he lived or stayed. This brings me to a final remark about my recording of the Hammerklavier Sonata and my interpretation. Did Liszt play like that? Does my interpretation come close to his ideas about the Hammerklavier Sonata? I don't know. To know for sure, as I've said before, I would need to time travel, which fortunately I guess I cannot do. But what I can say is that this is my approach to an interpretation that is clearly inspired by Franz Liszt's duration and everything that we know about his interpretation of this wonderful work. With this, I guess it's now time for the music. I invite you to listen to my recording of Beethoven's Hammerklavier Sonata and to discover the complexity and the wonderful beauty hidden in this great masterpiece by Ludwig van Beethoven. Thank you very much.